on the cross and the blood this morning, the blood of Jesus. Now I am aware that in that the church in recent weeks has moved spiritually. I'm also aware that it can bring problems. Amen. The message that I bring is really emphasized by what I've seen and heard over the last weeks. Those who are at the top of the spiritual tree and those who see themselves at the bottom of the spiritual tree are going to be equally affected. Church, we are coming into a great time of spiritual power. I believe that what we have seen so far is literally the first small wave or the first release of what is to come. We're going to come into a time of revival power. But it's essential that the whole church has got an understanding of what is happening, but more even so, is what is expected of them. We have seen a tremendous increase in the anointing on gifted people. We've seen the power of God flowing through men and women. So church, it's essential that we are right and that we remain right with the Lord. But this is a bit you won't like. It's going to cost. Because we're going to have to be careful who we meet, who we sit down with, and what we do. You can't run with the world and with God. You're going to have to make your mind up. You're going to have to choose. We will be faced with hard decisions. Can I firstly share with those who keep coming to me and say, we've always done it this way. We've always done it this way. Did you know that the US standard gauge, railway gauge, that's the distance between the rails, is four foot eight and a half inches? You didn't know that, but I'm telling you, all right? <laughs> Why is that such an odd number? Because that's the way they built them in England, so we're to blame, all right? And American railroads were built by British expatriates, that is, people who used to live in Britain. The next question is, well, why did the British use that particular gauge? Because the people who built the pre-railroad tramways used that gauge. They, in turn, were locked into that gauge because the people who built the tramways used the same standards and tools that they'd been building wagons for the road with. Four foot, eight and a half. Next question. Why were the wagons built to that scale? Because any other size, the wheels didn't match all the old ruts, wheel ruts in the road. So who built those old rutted roads? The first long distance highways in Europe were built by Imperial Rome. And those roads have been in use ever since. And if you're interested, the ruts were made by Roman war chariots, which were four foot, eight and a half inches wide, which was needed to accommodate the two rear ends of horses. Now, if you say to me, maybe that's the way it's always been, it isn't the good reason that some people try to make it out. We're stuck with it. Now, the next point I make is, we're going to have to choose whom we desire to please. The enemy is going to try and entice and lead us away from being one with the Lord. I'll pull no punches. 
those who are being used by the Lord are going to be encouraged to miss meetings or not to get involved too much take a break the enemy will use anyone and all things to try and prevent the work of God being completed in the fellowship see it for what it is it's the enemy at work now church is not the time for stepping back now is the time to press in we're coming into a, a time of great power and if we're not right we could miss the fullness of it in addition to the individual anointing I believe there's going to be a sovereign move of God I believe God's going to sweep over meetings in great power. We're going to see spontaneous salvation, spontaneous healing, spontaneous deliverance. It's all going to take place. And one of the key areas of allowing this is that you and I are involved in true worship. Romans 12 Offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God this is your spiritual act of worship let me tell you a true story a high school girl wrote the following letter to a friend I attended your church yesterday although you invited me you weren't there I looked for you, hoping to sit with you. I sat alone. A stranger. I wanted to sit near the back of the church, but those rows were all packed with regular attenders. <laughs> An usher took me to the front. I felt as though I was on parade. During the singing of the hymns, I was surprised to note that some of the church people weren't even singing. Between their sighs and their yawns, they just stared into space. Three of the kids that I had respected on campus were whispering to one another throughout the whole service. Another girl was giggling. I really didn't expect that in your church. The pastor's sermon was very interesting although some members of the choir didn't seem to think so they looked <laughs> bored and restless and one kept smiling at someone in the congregation there were several people who just got up and left and they came back after the sermon I thought how rude I could hear the constant shuffling of feet and doors opening and closing the pastor spoke about the reality of faith now that message got to me. I made up my mind to speak to somebody about it after the service. But there was utter chaos after the benediction. I said good morning to one couple, but their response was less than cordial. I looked for some teens with whom I could discuss the sermon, but they were all huddled in a corner talking about the newest music group. My parents don't go to church. I came alone yesterday hoping to find a place to truly worship and feel some love. I'm sorry, but I didn't find it in your church. I won't be back. Church, if reverence for God is to return to our nation, and we're praying and praying on a Tuesday morning for this, it's going to have to start with God's people. Amen. Don't expect the world. It's got to start amongst you and I, amongst God's people, to have reverence. You know, for this to be, one has got prepared, not for an hour, it's got to become a way of life. No good just turning up in church, because you're going to be the odd fish out of it. I'll tell you that now. It's got to become a way of life. Just getting caught up with God during a meeting is not enough. 
One has got to be caught up with God all the time. And I, I know what God desires of the meeting. You see, the, let me, the final act of worship is going to rest on those who lead the church. I don't want to put them under pressure, but it's going to rest on the worship group. And they have got to be right with God. They've got to know what God desires of the meeting. Let me put it simply to you. Their heartbeat has got to be one with God's heartbeat. You might have heard of Warren Wearsby. He wrote this. True biblical worship so satisfies our total personality that we don't have to shop around for man-made substitutes. And I go with that all the way. But another man by the name of William Temple made it clear this is his definition of worship. For worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imaginations by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of his will to his purpose, and all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable, and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin, and source of all actual sin, worship. You see, if we as a church are right with God, he will use us for his purpose. And hallelujah, we shall see his glory. Now, I want to move on. But let me start by saying, in the paradoxical, that's a nice word for you, isn't it? Which, according to the dictionary, <laughs> says this, apparently to be speaking the absurd, but it is, or may be really true. Let me say this to you. We have come to a time when we have to be strong, bold, and powerful Yet above all, we have to remain weak. Let me say that again to you, because that is the paradoxical. We have come to a time when we have to be strong, bold, and powerful, yet above all, we have to remain weak. Take hold of those words, church, they're the truth. We must remain weak. The great danger of power is that you can become arrogant with it. Not just as individuals, but as a church. I've seen it happen because God chose to use someone and a church, they became arrogant in their approach to dealing with everyone else. Amen to that, brother. Because God raises a church up to do a work, they become arrogant in their approach to the other churches and the believers. Now you and I have got to be careful as a church and individuals that we do not get into the doctrine that we are the ones who are right. The only ones who are right. I have seen too many leaders and ministries fail because of the doctrine I am right. Truthfully, that doctrine is as binding as grave clothes. We can lose sight of what God is doing or even what God wants to do because we can't be told anything. I've said this many times to you, church. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants without your permission. And he can do it when he wants and how he wants and not according to our theology and our ideas. God 
congest, do it. And if we are in the truth, then it's going to be revealed. You don't have to force it. It's just like a seed that you plant, which grows, breaks up through the soil. That's how the truth will be seen in our lives. It will just emerge. Can I say this to those who believe they've got a gift or a calling from God? Please, and I say that, a big please. Don't try to assert or push your position. If it's God, then he will raise up at the right time. It won't be a day short or a day late. Just obey God, move when he tells you, and that ministry will flourish and grow. So there's a paradox. We have to be powerful, yet we also have to be weak. Would you like to turn to 2 Corinthians 12? I'm in verse 7. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Come on, church, take hold of that truth. In the Christian faith, nothing is more powerful than weakness. Our weakness provides the basis for God to release his full power through us. Let me give you another little true story. When Dr. Larry Stevenson arrived in Somalia to work among the lepers, he was instantly welcomed. He wouldn't have been except for his weakness. Several years earlier, in a farming accident, Larry lost all but the first knuckle of the four fingers of his left hand. It was sometimes a great handicap when he was doing work, but it was his greatest asset in Somalia. The lepers spotted his crippled hands and concluded he's one of us. Because if you don't know about leprosy, the fingers and all the parts begin to drop off with leprosy. He was able to achieve things among them that someone with a strong left hand could not have. When I'm weak, then I am strong. You and I have got to work out God's salvation with God's strength. Let me share another true story. And I wasn't a boat for some of you. It was in the year 1818. All right? <laughs> and it was in France. And Louis, a boy of nine, was sitting in his father's workshop. The father was a harness maker and the boy loved to watch his father working on the leather. Someday father said Louis, I want to be a harness maker just like you. Why not start now? said the father. He took a piece of leather and drew a design on it. No my son, he said, take the hole puncher and a hammer and follow this design. But be careful that you don't hit your hand. Excitedly, the boy began to work. But when he hit the hole punch, it flew out of his hand and pierced his eye. He lost a sight of that eye immediately, and later sight in the other eye began to fail. Louis was now totally blind. A few years later, he was sitting in the family garden when a friend handed him a pine cone. 
As he ran his sensitive fingers over the cone, an idea came to him. He became very enthusiastic and began to create an alphabet of raised dots on paper so that the blind could feel and interpret what was written. Thus Louis Braille opened up the whole new world for the blind, the blind all because of an accident. If you want to be strong and powerful in the Lord, then do not take upon yourself the responsibility of becoming strong and powerful. It's the Lord who's strong and powerful. We remain weak. So let me dwell on this weakness. Can I go on? Are you okay? Yes. Within the church, yes, this church, I still hear people trying to defend themselves or their loved ones. And normally, sad to say, it's at the expense of someone else's reputation or position. The sarcastic remarks, the cynical or the negative remark aimed at someone who appears to be threatening your position, your work, or your weakness. Come on, church, we need to get to a place where by faith we gain the knowledge that God is our defender. If we have to keep defending ourselves or our, possession, our position, then we really haven't reached the fullness of our faith. Now let me say that once I was one who was totally insecure in my place in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage that if God can build me to a place of security, he can do it for you. Let me give you an incident in my life. It came, it came back to me. I once was invited to go up into Wales, North Wales to speak at a minister's meeting, a gathering of ministers. There were 30 of us gathered together. I looked around the room and I realized that I was probably the least qualified person in the room, but I was the invited speaker. There were doctors of theology, masters of theology, bachelors of theology, and every other degree you want to name, they were all sat in front of me. Now, 20 years previous to that, I, just after I got ordained in 1988, I was invited to go to an association meeting. Now, the association meeting was down in Pembroke. And every year they chose a minister to speak to all the other ministers before the business side of it started. And my name must have come out of the hat because they chose me to go and speak to them. Now, I've just been ordained, and I looked back. As I looked around that room, I knew fear. And I had a job to speak. I was literally shaking in my shoes when I stood up. And today I look back and I shuddered at the attempt that I made that day to give a presentation. But this time, up in North Wales, when I stood up, I was aware that I was there because God wanted me there. God had brought me there, and what's more, he'd equipped me for it. And praise God, he was with me and he used me. Church, we've got to come to a place where we have absolutely nothing to fear from anything or anyone, because we know that God who is defending us, is all-powerful, but above all, he's present. You see, so many are robbed of their power because they lack confidence in their standing in Jesus Christ. They are continually having to defend their position. Let me illustrate the point. Jesus said that we are to love our enemies, which means instead of speaking hard, negative words, we are to speak warm, genuine words of love. David, when he was hiding from King Saul, refused to harm or even speak against him, even though he had many opportunities to do it. I'm reminded that David, as he was retreating from Absalom, met a man 
called Shemai, who cursed him and threw stones at him. The warriors who were with David wanted to kill the man. But David stopped them and he said, and I quote from 2 Samuel, It may be that the Lord will see my distress and repay me with good for the cursing I am receiving today. David trusted the Lord to defend him. Church, most of the weapons used by Christians, I don't know whether you know this, they come out of weakness. Sadly, we might have the weapon, but the power of the weapon is lost because our standing with the Lord is not complete. Let me put it another way. We may have the weapon, but we haven't got a launching pad for the weapon. So let me take a few weapons that we can use. Been on about this a lot lately. Forgiveness. I've been asked, that, by the way, I've been asked if I do a day's teaching on forgiveness. It'll probably be in October, okay? Forgiveness. This is probably one of the least understood and used powers in the Christian church or in the Christian warfare. I use Jesus on the cross. If he had not spoken the words to the Father, forgive them, you and I wouldn't be meeting today. There wouldn't be a church. There would be no hope of eternal life. Those words cut right through the enemy's plans and it destroyed all that Satan had gained. Father, forgive them. There is tremendous power in the words of forgiveness. But they've got to be spoken from a repentant heart. There is the big step. There's got to be a heart change. I listen to people praying for forgiveness, but the prayer is wasted because inside their hearts are bone and as hard as stone just as their words. I once shared, and forgive me Barbara, because you partly shared this the other night. I once shared at another church the story of a minister's wife who had become angry because people had borrowed things and not returned them. She had, without knowing it, bound up the people by her bitterness and her unforgiveness. Her church had asked a gifted man of God to come and speak at one of the meetings. And he chose to speak and unlock the mystery of forgiveness. But at the end of the meeting, she began to release all those that she'd bound. And amazingly, the next Sunday, people began returning all the borrowed items. <laughs> this is a true story, okay? Yeah. It actually happened in Hawaii. Now, one of the ladies, I'll carry on a bit more. Barbara did that bit, but there's more to it. One of the ladies listening to my words that I was sharing went away and decided to put them into being. And she came back to me and she related this story a few weeks later. She said, I live in a block of flats and there was a lady who always spoke and shared with me, but for some reason or other, she'd stopped speaking and this had gone on for months and it was causing hurt. So the lady, remembering what we had shared, began to offer up a prayer of forgiveness towards the lady. Amazingly, the following week she was approached by this lady and she said, I'm sorry for the way I've been treating you. I've been rather foolish. Will you come and have tea with me? Now let me move on. Let me bring another weapon that is not often seen or even thought as a weapon. Humbleness. Some have great difficulty with this area in their lives. Many still see it as a sign of weakness. I tell you the truth, unless we are truly humble, we will never know the fullness of God's power in our lives. It's one of the foundation stones that is required to launch God's weapons. And I'm not talking about the pretense that is often offered up in place of humbleness. 
That is just mockery to God. Just a camouflage for pride. It doesn't take much to penetrate that charade of humbleness. If you just scratch it, you'll see the real person underneath it. Okay? Humbleness allows others to have preeminence. It does not seek position or favor or even to be well liked. You're going to be fit tonight, Lo? <laughs> All right. Humbleness allows others to have preeminence. There's a lovely story of a minister who had for years looked after the church and had had quite a successful ministry. And a new man of God came to town to start a church. And each week he stood in the pulpit and he denounced the workings and the ways of this older minister and the church. The members of the minister's church were dismayed and urged the minister to do something, to confront the man of God or write an article denouncing the words. The minister just smiled and carried on with his, with his work. Never once did he speak against the other man. Within months, the new church had failed and closed. The man of God moved on somewhere else. You see, it's God who defends. You and I don't need to defend. God will do it. Beloved, if I dare call you that, if we truly desire to see God move in this place, then each of us has got a responsibility to give God the foundation for him to move. Church, we have a paradox that we have to be powerful, yet we have to remain weak. Now let me say again that once I was one who was totally insecure in my place in Christ. I want to encourage that if God can build me to a place of security, he can do it for you. It's by our weakness that we become totally dependent on God. I'll give you a scripture which is a promise and it's all that you really need to stand on. Matthew 28, verse 20. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Church, we need nothing else other to know that God is with us. Now I believe the Spirit wants to do some healing amongst us. I don't want anyone to get up out of their seats. But if the Spirit has quickened any words to you tonight about being defensive, then I ask in obedience to Him that you start by asking forgiveness from God for not trusting Him and his promise. So let's have just a moment of silence. And then I would ask that you ask for forgiveness for speaking or thinking negative words towards another. And you may also want to deal with pride, which is love gone sour, which prevents you from being humble. You see, the enemy has taken captive the defensive words and the thoughts that we aimed at others and use them to bring curses upon people. So I want to do something. In the name of Jesus, I retrieve every curse word which has been spoken defensively and is held by the enemy. 
I bring them beneath the blood of the cross of Jesus. I break their power and the bondage and loose the captive. And I remind the enemy that he who died on the tree took every curse upon himself that we might be free. And finally I ask, ask the Spirit to help you to become truly humble and not self-seeking. Because God wants to use each and every one of you. God wants to move in this place. Amen? Amen. Thank you, group.